it never ceases to amaze me that birds live in the air. Their environment is this invisible fluid that surrounds us, the atmosphere. If you don't take that for granted, the question that should naturally occur to you is how do they fly? When I was growing up, my father worked as an aeronautical engineer. And one of the principles that he taught me that I guess I've really never forgotten is if something works, it's not happening by accident. Successfully flying, I mean really flying, controlled flight, it's going to have to be coordinated, carefully engineered. I imagine human beings sitting and watching birds for millennia yearning to be able to do what the birds do. And finally, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, we figure out how to do it for ourselves with the aid of a machine. As long as human beings have walked the earth, their eyes and hearts have turned to the skies. Our fascination with flight and the desire to experience it have inspired a myriad of inventions that can lift us, at least momentarily, into the avian world. But for all of the creative brilliance their construction requires, a mechanically powered aircraft of any design pales when compared to a gull on the Depending upon its species, a female can lay as many as 20 eggs in a season. Then, she will devote herself to their care throughout an incubation period that usually lasts between two and seven weeks. Since Aristotle, scientists have studied the eggs of a chicken to unlock the mysteries of a bird's development from a single cell. Remember that all birds develop in the same way. So if I'm looking at a superb flying bird, let's say a swift or a swallow or something like that, it's going to develop in about the same way as a, as a chicken embryo develops. And every mechanism that is necessary for flight, every adaptation for flight that you find in doves, that you find in eagles, vultures, they're all there in a chicken. The developmental process begins soon after fertilization and accelerates once the egg is laid, as thousands of cells rapidly multiply and organize inside the protective shell. In the early hours, you see the foundation for this organism that's coming later on being laid down. You see the, you know, the front and the back and the top and the bottom and all of those things being worked out in this cascade of events. Where's the head going to be? Where's the tail going to be? What's right, what's left, what's front versus back? 
already these major axes are being established. And as these cells are moving and heading towards the places in the embryo where they're going to develop, they're also changing what they're going to do eventually. They're committing themselves, in most cases, irreversibly to particular functional roles. On day two, the bird's spinal cord, ears and eyes take shape. Its vascular and circulatory systems are established, and its heart beats for the first time. At hour 46, the head of the embryo starts to arch into the fetal position. Throughout the second day, a network of blood vessels branches from the embryo into the yolk. They will transport vital nutrients back to the growing organism. You've got to pay attention to the details. You have genes being switched on and off, interaction, cell communication. It's an elaborate dance. It's like a ballet taking place on a stage with thousands of cast members. All of them are doing everything they're supposed to on cue, in the right order, in the right sequence, in the right time. The process itself is so amazing. It transcends anything we know. With the groundwork of major systems and organs now in place, the next 19 days are devoted to the completion of their development. So you've gone from that one cell that can become anything and 21 days Billions of different cells doing hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of tasks in the organism. The speed, the efficiency, the elegance of the whole process. What you're seeing is a mechanism at work. Information being translated into a physical product at each step along the way. Machines doing jobs. It's absolutely Incredible, absolutely incredible. Every bird born into the world starts life preoccupied with the same obsessions. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Weak and often blind for several days, most nestlings are totally reliant upon their parents for food. And they quickly learn to associate the vibrations made by an adult landing near the nest with the arrival of their next meal. As the young birds grow, their muscles strengthen. Primary feathers fill out and align, and functional wings take shape. All in preparation for the endeavor that will define the rest of their lives. Flight. The parents aren't going to feed them forever. In fact, that's one of the encouragements that parents will give baby birds to fly. They'll move a distance away from them, not give them their food in the nest, so they have to come out. And you'll see baby birds working their way up to this. You know, they'll be standing on the edge of the nest and just getting the feel for what those, what those wings can do for them. Oceanic birds on remote islands, they'll spend days watching their parents before ever attempting that first flight. And we have to assume they're fast learners. Here's this feathered downy chick that gets bigger and bigger, and some adult feathers start coming through the down. But finally it has his wings, so he spends all day taking periodic flaps of his wings.
In November 2011, Time magazine honored a miniature aircraft as one of the best inventions of the year. Designed to mimic a hummingbird in flight, the Nano Air Vehicle, or NAV, was developed by a team of engineers in Southern California. This prototype of an experimental surveillance drone is equipped with a video camera and can hover, rotate, and fly in any direction. It's a sensational piece of engineering. Really incredible work, especially when you consider that all the parts are encased in a package that weighs about the same as a AA battery. But in terms of its complexity and abilities, the NAV is still light years behind the bird that inspired its creation. Hummingbirds have to be among the most fascinating birds I've ever encountered. Kind of made a lifetime avocation of studying them and filming them and getting to know them. There are 343 recognized species today, and all of them are found in North America, Central and South America. Vibrant, beautiful, and wonderfully unique. Hummingbirds are among the most breathtaking creatures on the planet. Often described as nature's helicopters, their acrobatic displays, powered by wings that can beat more than a hundred times a second, are unparalleled in the avian world. Hummingbirds are built for speed and maneuverability. They're zipping around, incredible aerobatics, going backwards, forward, hovering in midair. The tail is a balancing organ. It helps guide which direction they want to go. They can raise it to zoom up. They can drop it to stall. They can use it to go side to side. It's, it's highly maneuverable. The flight muscle in a typical hummingbird represents about 43% of the body mass. It gives them a tremendous power to do these kinds of maneuvers that most birds cannot even dream of accomplishing. Hummingbirds routinely employ three specialized types of flight. To fly forward, the wings flap rapidly up and down, generating thrust. Then to hover, their angle and movement are radically adjusted to create a figure eight pattern that stabilizes the bird's body in the air as it feeds. And to fly backward, the wings move in a circular path above the bird's head. No other bird can fly like this because no other bird has a skeletal system designed to function like a hummingbird's. And this becomes obvious when you compare a hummer to a large bird like a raptor. For a red-tailed hawk and virtually every other species of bird, the mechanics of powered flight are similar. Its wings flap up and down, like paddles on hinges, creating lift only on the downstroke. In contrast, while hovering, a hummingbird flaps its wings backward and forward to generate lift on both strokes. Hummingbirds need to hover in a fixed position, meaning that they need lift all the time and their shoulder joint provides a unique solution to the problem. It can rotate a wing 140 degrees by twisting the upper arm bone. And when the bone twists, the entire wing inverts as it's coming back up actually to generate part of the lift that they require to maintain their stability in the air. The hummingbird's rigorous lifestyle is also sustained by its muscular, metabolic, and circulatory systems. To keep this mass of flight muscle filled with oxygen carrying blood, the bird's heart has to beat as much as 1,250 beats a minute. Just think of the speed of the nerve synapses. I mean, all of this is being controlled by nerves, firing at an incredible rate to make this possible. The hummingbird is fueled for flight by consuming more than twice its body weight in nutrients each day. 
so during its waking hours, the bird eats every 10 to 15 minutes. It has been estimated that to survive, an adult human being with comparable metabolism would require 150 pounds of food every 24 hours. The engineering demonstrated in the bird's anatomy is again ingenious. The hummingbird's tongue is about twice as long as its beak, so it can reach deep into a flower. And until recently, many scientists believed that the birds relied heavily on capillary action to draw the nectar through their tongues and into their mouths. Kind of like water spontaneously rising up a thin straw in a glass. But some fascinating discoveries at the University of Connecticut have shown that the mechanisms involved are much more dynamic than anyone realized. The hummingbird's tongue is actually a nectar trap equipped with a pair of narrow tubes that taper sharply. The tip of each tube is segmented into a row of flaps that are attached to a supporting rod. When the bird isn't eating, these flaps form two rows of closed loops that fit compactly into the beak. But when the hummingbird feeds, its tongue undergoes a dramatic transformation. Inside the flower, the tongue extends to make contact with the nectar. When immersed in fluid, the tip splits and the flaps on each fork systematically unfurl. Then as the tongue is withdrawn, the flaps close tightly to seal and capture the nectar for delivery into the bird's mouth. This entire process is executed automatically in less than a twentieth of a second, thousands of times a day. From flower to flower to flower to flower, this brilliant iridescent body, there's a kind of jewel-like quality that they have. This exquisite workmanship, the colors and the sound that they make. I think in some respects, the wonder of a hummingbird almost transcends language. And we respond to what we see at a level really, you could say, deeper than rationality. I mean, it's not irrational but it's almost like responding to the work of an artist. And at that level, we respond with our soul, with our emotions. What can you say? Words can't do it justice. So you just stand there and applaud. The avian world is a tapestry of both the mysterious and the unexpected. A showcase of behaviors that can surprise, inspire, and fill a human heart with wonder. On a January morning in southern England, flocks of European starlings depart from the heath where they had roosted throughout the previous night. In an explosion of motion and sound, the birds disperse to the surrounding countryside where they will feed throughout the day. Twelve hours later, each will return to take part in one of nature's most spectacular displays. For filmmaker Dylan Winter, starlings have long been a source of fascination and study. I've been a wildlife photographer for probably 30 years now and I've filmed animal behavior all over the world. 
but there is really nothing I've seen to match what happens here on Otmore, which is about three miles from my own back door. It just knocks you sideways. It is almost inexplicable, and tonight should be perfect. Late in the afternoon, small groups of starlings begin their journey back to the reeds and marshes that sheltered them the night before. Starlings are long-distance daily commuters. They'll travel up to 30 miles to get to their chosen roost. And they follow invisible aerial corridors, snaking through the countryside, avoiding the turbulence which... simple rule. When your neighbor moves, so do you. As a result, the slightest change of direction by one starling can trigger a chain reaction that ripples throughout the entire flock, creating constant variation within these immense formations. It's a little like fighter pilots flying in tight formations where they can be as close, wingtip to wingtip, as 18 inches. 
They're using a property called topological distance, where the individual pilots aren't actually monitoring the whole formation. Instead, they're watching their nearest neighbour and responding to every movement that he makes in the air. The aerial maneuvers of 200,000 starlings are even more demanding. The birds must each sense and react to the oscillations of the flock in less than 100 milliseconds, about three times faster than the blink of an eye. And their instinctive decisions are flawless. I'll walk home thinking, how wonderful is that? They have been called the birds of the sun, for they spend more than eight months a year in the perpetual daylight of the polar summers. Late May to early August in the Arctic region, from Alaska to Northern Europe and Asia. Then November until April in Antarctica and the Weddell Sea. In the process, they will travel from pole to pole during the longest migration of any animal on Earth. They are Sterna paradisia, the Arctic terns. A lot of birds migrate, but by almost any account, the Arctic turn has to be near the top, near or at the top of the list for incredible achievement. The more I learn about Arctic terns, the more I feel like I want to build a shrine to them in sheer admiration. Going from one end of the planet to the other, spending most of their life in the air, just never ceases to amaze me. The Arctic Tern's epic migration is a quest for both food and a safe haven to raise their young. The location of their primary nesting grounds in the north and feeding areas in the south were identified in the 1960s. But the birds were impossible to track over the open sea, so detailed knowledge of the actual route of their migration was almost non-existent. Many researchers speculated that terns breeding in the North Atlantic followed the coastlines of Europe and Africa as they traveled both north and south on a round trip of approximately 24,000 miles. Yet there was little evidence to confirm this theory. For Karsten Egevang of the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, the challenge to accurately map the turn's migration inspired pioneering research and groundbreaking discovery. Will you come as a center? Since I was little, uh, being a bird watcher, I, I knew about the Arctic turn. We know since the 1960s that the Arctic turns probably do this long migration, but it's never been able to prove it or to get details about it. For me, it's like a mystery that hasn't been solved yet. In 2007, 
Egevang led an expedition to Sand Island, a desolate patch of land off the northeast coast of Greenland. Here, a thousand pairs of Arctic terns arrived each June to feed, mate, and lay their eggs. The key to Egevang's research were geolocators, logging devices designed to measure and record levels of ambient sunlight and geographic positions anywhere along the turn's route. At 1.4 grams, each was small enough to attach to the bird's leg, but minimal weight came with a cost. Since the loggers lacked the components to transmit their data in real time, they would have to be recovered the following year. So one summer you will equip the bird with this logger, you will let the bird go and then you'll come back the next year and you have to locate that exact same individual in order to catch it once more and download the data. Over four weeks, 50 turns were banded and released. Egeveng then returned to Denmark while the birds headed south to Antarctica and a summer of feeding in the Weddell Sea. And then we waited a year back in Denmark just speculating how many birds would actually come back the following year. We really didn't know what to expect in terms of how many loggers, how high a percentage we would actually get back or if we were able to find the birds at all. In July 2008, Egevang returned to Sand Island and began the seemingly impossible task of retrieving the loggers. Well, it was certainly very time consuming to find the bird the following year. We have to find the bird in the air and then follow the bird to a nest. The only way to go about it is just to spend a lot of time and stare up at the air on hundreds of Arctic turn at the same time. And we were looking for a small uh, ring with a small logger on the ring. So it was very hard to see the actual logger in the air. So once we discovered the logger on the leg of the bird, we will keep our eyes focused on the bird and sort of follow it down on the ground and it would reveal its uh, nest place for us. And, and then we were.
true cause. What is the true cause of something? Now, in the case of the origin of flight, we have a complex function with all the associated anatomy and behavior and so forth. And the question we really should be asking is, what is the cause that is sufficient to bring this about? What is the vera causa of avian flight? Since the late 19th century, nearly all research has been limited to natural processes, most notably Darwinian evolution. This view of biology has given rise to several theories for the origin of flying birds. Many scientists now argue that small dinosaurs gradually evolved feathers, wings, and powered flight over millions of years as they ran and jumped to flee predators, leaped from limb to limb in trees, or flapped feather-covered arms to catch flying insects. Each of these theories is highly controversial, and each contends that the true cause of flight is grounded in scientific materialism and the belief that matter and energy are all that exist in the universe. From a materialist standpoint, you need some causal story, some account of how this unique function came to be. And, this is the critical point, you can't invoke a designer. No intelligence involved. Mind is excluded as a causal possibility. This assumption was captured eloquently by the Nobel laureate Francis Crick when he said, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. It's so hard not to use language that suggests a purpose in biology because everywhere we look we see purpose and we see design and yet we're told over and over it just looks like it's full of purpose it just looks like it's designed for a function there's a reason why a rule like that has to be imposed because if it isn't you're going to see that it's designed that's what our brains logically tell us Intuitively, the appearance of design in nature is unmistakable, and opportunities to test its validity are woven throughout the network of biological systems that make avian flight possible. A prime example is a feather. A bird's feathers are arranged to create a strong, highly efficient airfoil that produces lift as air moves rapidly over the curved top of the wing and slower beneath it. And as a consequence of that, there's a pressure differential. There's more pressure pushing up on the bottom of the wing than there is on top of the wing. So in a sense, a bird's actually sucked up into the air. As a bird glides or flaps, a network of muscles, ligaments, and bones constantly adjust the position of its feathers to achieve the highest maneuverability. The inherent precision of this system is even more evident when the structure of a single feather is magnified. One feather can contain a million individual parts and its overall structure is supported by a hollow shaft that runs up the center. Then, branching out diagonally from the shaft, Hundreds of strands, called barbs, give a feather its flexibility and aerodynamic shape. And when you move in closer, you see that each barb supports hundreds of even smaller structures called barbules. Barbules are arranged into sets of opposing pairs. Those extending from one side of a barb support a cluster of microscopic hooks and those on the other side are curled into ridges. As they overlap, the barbules interlock, hook to ridge, to create a zipper-like mechanism, and on a larger scale, a herringbone pattern that blocks the passage of air, bends freely, and allows a bird to easily repair breaks 
on the surface of its wings. Unless those individual components that you see in feathers work together appropriately, you're simply not going to have a functional feather. And we need to remember that the feathers are just a small part of this overarching combination of systems that allow birds to fly. The physical demands on a flying bird are severe and dozens of biological systems are designed to meet every challenge. The enormous quantities of energy and strength the bird requires are produced by hearts that beat more than 500 times a minute. Massive breast muscles that relentlessly power their wings. The most efficient respiratory systems in the animal kingdom. And digestive systems designed to fuel high metabolisms without taxing the stringent weight requirements of flight. Birds also depend upon navigational systems that can track the sun, constellations, and the Earth's magnetic field. An internal gyroscope to stabilize the orientation of their bodies during rapid movements in the air. Acute vision to identify food from half a mile above the Earth. and a battery of instincts that cue and direct migration journeys across oceans and continents. Obviously, you're coordinating many, many, many different systems that have to be all exactly right for the bird to fly. And the more systems and component parts that are involved, the more challenging it is to explain how all of them came together so precisely in a bird. In human aviation, the design and integration of complex operational systems are hallmarks of foresight, purpose, and plan. But in a bird, could a purely materialistic process like natural selection account for the even higher levels of engineering required for flight? No, and here's the problem. Natural selection is blind and unguided. It has no sense of direction, no sense of teleology is the big word that philosophers use. It doesn't know where it's going. The lack of foresight is the major problem. We know that if you throw all the parts for a 747 into the middle of a room and turn on a fan and blow everything around, you're not going to end up with a 747. We know it doesn't work that way. Intuitively, even when you've got all the parts,